unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Our reading and teaching tonight is going to be taken from the second book of Timothy, the third chapter, the seventh verse. It speaks of people which are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible says they are ever learning, but they are not able, they are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are such people. And so, of course, the question is, how does it happen? How does somebody ever learn, but not come to the knowledge of some? Because it's evident they are sitting under a teacher, they are sitting in a class, the mind is educated. They're receiving information. They're seeing all that is necessary. They are observing everything that is happening in the ministry, in the church, but they're never coming to the knowledge of the truth. I don't need to emphasize the importance of knowledge. The Bible says in Hosea that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. They perish for a lack of knowledge. People die in one part of the Bible, he speaks of how their honorable men are famished because they lack knowledge. They have no knowledge. Their glory is decimated. The multitudes are scattered. Their pomp is taken. And the Bible says they descend into destruction, into oblivion. Of course, we're in a time, sadly, where also I must emphasize that the word is scarce. I'm not saying that the churches are scarce or that they're not teaching people, that they're not platforms, televisions, radios, books that are written in the world in the name of Jesus Christ. But the authenticity of the word has been diluted. It has been diluted greatly. And those of you who are readers understand what I'm saying. And these are the wars and the decisions that we see in the body of Christ today. And that will not end. But also I believe that God is lifting up a standard. Hallelujah. He's lifting up a standard. For he prophesied through the prophet and says, in the last days knowledge shall be increased. And so in the equal measure of the scarcity of truth, there is a higher measure of the distribution of the same truth, albeit to a scarce number of people. But that is only for a time. Because the prophetic word given, he says this gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth. I shall fill the earth with my knowledge as the waters cover the sea. He says, and as this gospel is preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end shall come. There's a certain depth and preaching of the message that should usher the coming of the Messiah. It's only to that level of knowledge, that level of maturity, that level of consecration in the word of God that we shall see the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he is going to come back. He's going to return. The Bible says it's come for a church that is without spot, no wrinkle, no any such thing. And for the church to carry that purification, it cannot not be in their own works. The cleansing shall be the word of God as it continues to be preached in the truth that it is preached. The righteousness that is imputed through faith. He says that he might sanctify the church and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. So we believe that knowledge is increasing as well as it is scarce in certain spaces. But as it continues to increase and the truth is given in its purity, a lot is going to happen. A lot is going to happen. I can't emphasize enough that the reason why we don't see the power in the church as we should is because we have left the way of truth. It's the beginning of our liberty. The Bible says, for you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We want to go beyond the giftings that we demonstrate. Yes, we've seen the sick healed, all manner of diseases. I have seen it. We've seen it in this ministry. We see it across the world. 
But it's not just enough to see the miracles and signs and wonders. Because sometimes we cast so much of that and men are lost without drawing them back to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible says that he wills that all men be saved and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. He just didn't end in the space of salvation. Yeah, salvation is a good thing. But he says he wills that all men be saved, comma, and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the other side that we must touch. So yes, yeah, much as I say, oh, let's preach the gospel. People should become born again. Jesus is about to return. He wills that all men be saved. And in the same verse, comma, and that they will come to the knowledge of the truth. And in Timothy, again, he's saying, 2 Timothy, that there are people which are ever learning, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is why some people surprise you. Somebody has been sitting under a wonderful teacher, a wonderful apostle, a wonderful prophet, a wonderful pastor. They've been taught for five, six, seven, ten years, 20 years, 12 years. They've sat under a very good, good minister, a fine teacher of the word. And then tomorrow they go away. They give into something. They fall into something. They do something. They say something. And you wonder, did this person really, really come to the knowledge of the truth? And sometimes it's not that there's probably abuse somebody else and some could. Sometimes it's Disaster comes, you know. Adverse things happen around this person. And then they react and respond to a circumstance as though they have never come to the knowledge of the truth. Some in the days of adversity, they have fainted. They've drawn back to perdition. They've compromised. They have breached their spirits in the days of testation. And so the Bible says, yes, they're ever learning ever learning, but never come to the knowledge of the truth. And there are people who can come into the gospel, sit for two, three years, or four, five, six months, and they understand it. And they run with it. You say, but this fellow has just gone to understand the message two, three, four, five days ago. How come they understand this thing fully? It's different. Perhaps the other is just learning, but never come to the knowledge. But one is learning and coming to the knowledge of the truth. So we ask ourselves the fundamental question. Why don't people come to the knowledge of the truth? Why don't people come to the knowledge of the truth, even though they are ever learning? And then they're beaten with simple diseases. They are killed easily. They get problems easily. Things fall apart quickly or easily. They are easily attacked. They are easily defeated. In every aspect, their finances are crumbling easily. Things just happen so much in their lives that you ask yourself, are these guys really Christian? Yes, but they've sat under the right teaching. And in the same ministry, the same church, there's somebody who is walking right and living the life that we have in Christ Jesus. So the question, why? Let me first say this. Perception is reality. Your reality dwells in your perfection. Perception the way you see things, the eyes with which you see things. And your reality is your world. You can never exceed the realities that are beyond your perception. The world that you're living right now is the world that has been provided for according to your level of faith because we understand by faith. The Bible says that the worlds are framed by the word of God. By faith, we understand. It's an understanding of men which have alluded to the mystery of faith. That the worlds that we live in, the eons, the periods, the appointed things in the spirit for us to provide for us, for our, you know, joy, provision, and destiny, are all framed by the word of God. And what is the essence of the word of God? To give us the faith that we need. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And in the world that you're in is the definition of what is real to you. And so I want to tell you that reality varies based on individual perception. There's a man going through something. It's so bad that he's not going to sink in it. And there's a man going through the same thing, albeit in a light weight, in a light mode, in a more simpler 
attack of the same issue and is going to die in the same thing. There's a man in the world right now who has been diagnosed with a stage 4 cancer and that man is going to live a full life. And there's a person right now who has been diagnosed with stage 1 cancer and that person is surely going to die. They have the same attacks, but one man's perception, one man's reality is framed, is shaped by his reason of faith and understanding to a provision of divine health. And another is going to die in the same. There are people in the world who are earning the same amount of money at the same job, seated on the same desks next to each other. But in the next five years, one is going to be a millionaire in dollars and another one is going to be looking for rent. But they earn the same amount of money. There are students in the world right now who have done the same degree. You have graduated with the same degree or the same master's degree or the same doctorate degree. You look around each other and you think that you're all going to take the same course. But in the next six or seven years, something is going to happen. And one student will be begging and another one will be a minister. Another one perhaps will be a president. And all of them went to the same school, did the same exams. And perhaps even one excelled above the rest who was top of the class. But when he went to the world, the way of life was not kind with them. It was not kind with them. It's possible. There's a person who's going to start a ministry in one year and in two years. And it's going to have tens of thousands of people. And there's a man who's going to run ministry for 20 years, 30 years, and not be able to take off even with five members. And you can say, oh no, numbers are not important. It's not about the numbers. It's about what God has called you to do. Yes, but we all know what God has called us to do. He has called us to occupy until he comes. He has given us a mandate and a responsibility to preach the gospel to the whole world. To the whole world. To the whole world. He has not limited us in how much we can eat if we are able to eat. He has not limited our nets in the catching. He only taught us to be fishers of men. But on how much you're going to catch, how much time you're going to invest, how big the boat is going to go on the sea, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to you. It's all ready. Cancer in the heart of a man is at deep waters. But the man with understanding can draw it out. So it doesn't mean that you're limited in counsel. It only means that you're limited at how much you can draw depending on how much you are able to draw. It's your responsibility to draw more. But we've all given the same spirit. We have the same power. We have the same anointing. We have that glory. Albeit some people will go ahead of others, you know, because perhaps they are born with something special. But by and large still, the eunuch can be consecrated and elevated in glory because he has separated himself, the Bible says, for the sake of the kingdom. And so you're not limited by another man's advancement. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But the thing is that the thing that actually defines our spaces, the thing that defines our elevations, the thing that defines the multiplication of the graces, it's how we hear God. It's not that we hear God but it transcends to how we hear God. Because God spoke to everybody in the Bible. God speaks to the devil. You see him in the days of Job, and he's telling the devil, have you considered my servant Job? This is God speaking to the devil. But that doesn't mean that the devil earns any space higher than his realm because he hears the voice of God. The Bible tells us of Laban. Laban did not worship the God of the Jews. He did not worship the God of Jacob. No. That's why he follows them after chasing them, that they might give him back his gods. He worshipped certain gods. But the God of Jacob appeared to him and told him, do this boy no harm. Laban, in his own words, he tells Jacob that your God appeared to me and told me to do you no harm. We see God giving Pharaoh's dreams. He speaks. to men who are not even in covenant. He speaks. He speaks. So he's a speaking God, both to those that are in the faith and those that are outside the faith. He can speak to the most wicked man. That's how salvation comes. So it's not just about hearing God, but in which realm are you hearing God? In which realm is he speaking to you? In which realm are the two of you communicating? Because the degree of the voice of God and communication that a man has with God is the definition of that man's consecration, that man's elevation, the graces that will operate on that man's life for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. When Aaron, Miriam, Moses were born in the same family, God consecrated them to be prophets in their own right. 
And all of them had God. That is why when Moses marries a Cushite wife, Aaron and Miriam say for the first time that doesn't God speak to us too? Has he not spoken to us that we're not supposed to marry of the wives of the heathen? And God gets angry. He's angry at people who can hear him. <laughs> they have confessed with their own words that they can hear God. But they have lost a certain space. God does not speak with them a certain way. And then he asks them, Were well, you not afraid to speak of my servant Moses? And in Numbers, the 12th chapter, in the 8th verse, he speaks of how he speaks to Moses. He says, when I'm speaking to Moses, the Bible says, I speak with him mouth to mouth. And he says, even apparently, and he says, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? He's telling them you should be afraid to speak about him because of the way I speak to him. Did you get that? He said, you should be afraid to talk about this man or this woman because I don't speak to him the way I speak to you. In other words, even our authorities to judge certain realms are subject to where we're able to hear God. We're not allowed to judge realms higher than we can hear. It doesn't matter how much we design in our own realms. So I tell you, if you're fourth dimensional, you cannot judge fifth dimensional. If you're fifth dimensional, you cannot judge seven dimensional, even if a window is open to you, to design an error in the seven dimension. Why? Because to your vision in your fourth or third dimension, in what you see and perceive as error, could be truth in the seven dimension. It could be truth in the seven dimension. Oh, Paul, you should be walking in love. You should be walking in love. You're the one who teaches love. You are the one who has laid the foundation of the gospel. And he says, and some we actually handed over to the devil for torment because their souls should be saved on that day. And so to lose both, we construct or punctuate something in the spirit for destruction of their flesh that their spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord. Is that walking in love? Why would you hand a man over for destruction for the salvation of his soul? No, darling, you're speaking from a lower realm. You're asking from a realm that is so low to discern the things and the ways of the Spirit. But if you are a reader of the Word, you'd understand that in love, Paul is seeing that if this man continues in the flesh, we will lose both. And there's the understanding that you should fear not one who can destroy the body or the flesh, but one which can take the soul. So he says, you know what? If I'm going to lose this fellow, if he continues in the flesh, I would rather hand over his flesh for destruction because then he will be given eternal life and he has a longer life to live. But in which realm do you even judge to give a man over? Which realm approves you to judge a man over? So not everybody has the right to do that. I see people who pronounce judgments that they are not qualified of realms to pronounce such judgments. And to know the difference, again, I say, is wisdom. It's wisdom. And that is why you see that when Jesus was speaking to men, when Jesus was communicating to men, was, is, will communicate to men. He used to speak to men according to where they're able to understand him. He speaks to men according to where they're able to understand him. He will always speak to men according to where they're able to understand him. He didn't go beyond that. He didn't go beyond that. I have many things to say to you, he says in John. But he says, but she cannot bear them now. So it's the desire of him to speak. But he says, no, but you are not able to bear them now. You can't carry them. So he says, you know what? Tarry. There's one which will come who will be available to help you, teach you these things, take you step by step. Because perhaps I designed for me to tell you these things, I need time to walk with you in the course of of your understanding. And I don't have that time now because I'm about to go up in glory. And so he leaves the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why he says the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach you all things and to remind you that which you have forgotten. Why do men think that the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to move in the meeting? Why do men think that the primary ministry of the Holy Spirit is to open the blind eye and the deaf ear and the dumb speaking and raising the dead man? No, that is secondary. The primary ministry of this comforter, this paracletos, is to teach you. He will teach you, the Bible says, all things. It has, there is no limitation 
to the knowledge that you can access if you are available to access. Kara brozetele broko shatalapa. Keke branda labaza kato jikatalapa. Ko brazate bo jikete. Ho sanda brete. Ko rilabazaba ko zando robo zaba kashata. He says, I'm not limited to how much I can teach you. I am dealing with you according to how much you are able to receive from me, saith the Lord. According to how much you're able to receive from me. According to how much you are able to receive from me. That is why in Corinthians, the Amplified Version calls him the revealer of the bottomless things which are in God. So the things in him to reveal are bottomless. Are bottomless. The challenge is that in our dispensation, like I've already said, we're not contemplative. We don't have time to sit and search out a matter. When you read the man of Ecclesiastes, you hear a man using a language like, for I searched, I took my time to study the things that amuse the men under the earth. And this was a contemplative man. He took time, he searched, and I returned under the sun and I saw. He was a searcher of the truth, of the things of God. And as you continue to search, things are unveiled. So we're talking about the seeking of God. We're talking about seeking for your healing. If you're sick, we're talking about the seeking of the understanding of the mystery of divine help. You see the difference? There's one man seeking God for a job. There's another man seeking God for the mystery of divine provision. One is seeking for the charisma. The other one is seeking for charismatos. One is seeking for the gifting. The other one is seeking for the source of that gift. We cannot be equal because God will communicate differently to us. So we see that in Ecclesiastes 7, verse says, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom. I applied my heart to know, to search, to seek out wisdom. How often do you open your Bible to seek the truth? To understand wisdom, to connect with divine knowledge. See, so God will speak to you differently from the man who is not contemplative. That's just the way of the Spirit. In the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter, we know the story of the sower sowing seeds, some on stony ground, some on rocky ground, some on the wayside, good ground, etc. And the disciples are disturbed. They are confused. This fellow is speaking in parables. The Bible says, Jesus, without parables, spake he not unto them. He was speaking to the people in parables. Disciples are disturbed. They're confused. Why is he always speaking in parables? In the 13th verse, Jesus says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. They seeing, and I want you to hear, see not. That's number one. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. Which comes first? The seeing. If you see right, you will hear right. If you will hear right, you'll understand right. That's the order of the spirit. You see? So he's saying, you see, they see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. They don't understand. And so because of that, I'm going to speak to them in parable. We see God from the beginning of the world speaking to men in, by words, in sayings, in adages, in proverbs, using stories, using riddles. Even the message version in that part where he says, and when I speak to Moses, I don't speak to him in dark sayings. The message version uses the word, I don't speak to him in riddles. Some receive riddles. We see the judges, Samson, speaking, communicating in riddles. God is speaking through Samson in riddles. That means if the people that God was speaking to in that time were able to apprehend the mystery of God as it is spoken, they would not receive God's message or instruction in riddles. So you see Jesus speaking in parables. In the 14th verse, he says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Underline the word there for perception. You shall see and not perceive. And he says, For this people's heart 
is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Now, I want you to note that. Here, he says their heart is waxed gross, but it does not explain the cause or the reason of why the heart is waxed gross. And then he comes to the ears being dull of hearing, and he does not explain so much the cause of the dullness of this hearing. But when it gets to their eyes, the Bible says their eyes have closed. He didn't say their eyes are blinded. He says their eyes, they have closed. That means that there's a deliberation in a man knowing how to open their eyes to see the things they must see. Because here you see that the decision to open the eye is what opens up for the awakening of the heart and the aligning of the ear to hear the right way. Hello? Hallelujah. Praise God. So you see that it's as though we might not explain whether it was their choice for their heart to wax gross. We might not be able to understand whether it was their choice for their ears to dull in hearing. But definitely, when the Bible says their eyes, they have closed, that's a choice. As I said, most importantly, the eyes should be open. Because you have a choice on your vision, on what you choose to see. You have a choice on the definition of your vision. Again, I said, perception is your reality. And he continues to say, least at any time they should see, again, it begins with the vision, with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and they should be converted, and I should heal them. I always love to emphasize the word should. Because your healing can get from the realm of could, might to should heal you. Your breakthrough financially can get from the realm of will, can, wants to should provide for you, should deliver you, should elevate you, should promote you. God should increase you. God should multiply you. God should consecrate you. God should work for you. It's a should thing. But he's saying, here is the mystery. This is the thing. He tells his disciples or the people watching that if you've not understood this parable, how will you understand the rest of the parables? Because not all truths are equal. And he says, look, certain things come before others. If you have not understood one thing, you will not understand the other. But you see, he says that I should heal them. And he tells them, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they should hear. There are two words there that all spell in the same portion of Scripture, sight, but one is different from the other. One different from the other, but all of them spell sight. And let us go back a bit here. He spoke of how they shall see and not perceive. So, when you speak in English, they almost sound the same words. When you study it from the Greek translation, one is different from the other. They shall see, underline the word, and not perceive. Because remember the problem here, again I said, begins with our vision, our perception. I insist, perception. So there are two Greek words here that are used. Now when he says, and seeing ye shall see, the word there is blepo, meaning to see or notice or design with your bodily eye. That means it's possible for you to see, design, notice things, take note of you know, events and Calculate things by your bodily eye, the eye of your body. The person who is blind in the flesh cannot say that they see with a physical eye. But if you see with a physical eye, that's exactly what I'm trying to talk about. That's blepo. But it says, but in seeing blepo, they shall not perceive. And the word there is eido or ido. And eido is defined as a noticing a designing, a discovery into knowledge, into a sense of knowledge, a certain kind of knowledge, a perfect knowledge of things. So some people see with their bodily eye. But we're talking about the seeing to know. The seeing that brings a certain knowledge in God. That's perception. That the things you see, do they teach you? The things your physical eyes will see. Do they instruct you? I read the Bible with my physical eye. But that doesn't mean that because I can cram scriptures in my head, it means that I can demystify the mystery of the person of Jesus Christ. There is a very clear nuance, a clear dichotomy, a clear chasm, a clear difference. It's like saying that because you went to theology school, therefore you are qualified to preach the gospel. 
I'm not against theology school. It's good to go to theology school. But not all who went to theology school can teach Jesus Christ. And not all who did not go to theology school cannot teach about Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? Because to see with your senses, with your normal eye, with your bodily eye, is different from the perception of the spirit. Edo. The knowledge of God that comes to you because of the things you will see. And here, he's talking about another set of eyes. Because he's talking about the eyes of your understanding. You see in Ephesians, it says that the eyes of your understanding, being flooded with light, you will know what is the hope of your calling, what are the glorious riches of inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of power that is at work within you, the same that he wrote when he raised Christ from the dead. You see, greatness of power comes from a door. The knowledge, the understanding, with the eye, the right eye. The hope of your calling, the glorious riches of the inheritance of the saints, all of that comes when you have a unique eye. When you don't have that eye, you will ever learn but never come to the knowledge of the truth. That's exactly what it means. You will continuously learn, but you will not come to the knowledge of the truth. Sometimes we will even have experiences where what that eye of knowledge sees will not be able to not only confirm, but reconcile with what the physical eye will see. It will not be the first time we see such confusions, even in Scripture. Paul speaks somewhere in Corinthians where he says, I know the man. Yes, there are two men in there. But he says, but I know the man. Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter, it's the second verse. He says, I knew a man in Christ. Now, he's talking about the other fellow with the other kind of sight. He says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God know it. So yes, he says, in my flesh I might not be able to confirm the affirmations of the man who is in me yet had a certain vision with God. And he says that that man was caught up in the third heaven. And he says, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and he had unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. was the Amplified, which a man has no power to put in two words. And he says, of such a one I will glory, yet not of myself. Will I not glory, but in mine infirmities. He's saying, there's a guy in me that can see certain things. That man is awakened. That's a fellow that was standing with the third dimension of the spirit. He saw things which were not lawful to utter. He had things which were not lawful to utter. So if he's saying that these things a man had no power to put in two words, it means if those things have to be translated to men, they have to be translated in a figure. He says, of these things have I transferred in a figure to Apollos. He did not teach them as you would teach any other man because God has many facets of teaching. That is why they have a problem with a disciple who cuts out devils. He says, we found a guy casting out devils in your name. We forbid him. Why? He doesn't follow us. He's not in our meetings. And they have a problem because they think God can only teach a man only if he's in their meeting their own way. There are many ways with which God can teach men. There are many ways with which God can instruct men. And you dare not judge a man because he did not go to your Bible school. You dare not judge a man because he does not attend your religion. You don't judge a man because he doesn't go to your church. You don't think that your ministry is the only ministry that preaches the gospel. That's foolish. Because again, you have to get to a place of comparing yourself with another, comparing themselves with one another. The Bible says they became fools. That's why I use the word foolish. You are not called to compare yourself with what the other ministry does. Oh, I am the best, we are the best. No, 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 no. Do your course. Do your course. You'll be shocked at how many people out there are hearing God a certain way. They're hearing God a certain way. But again, there are people in the same congregation, the same faith, and the Bible says, who are ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They cannot come to the knowledge of the truth. So when the message comes, it it hits the house, not the spirit in the house. Remember the scriptures how when a devil is cast out, he goes in the dry places seeking for a place to rest. And if he finds none, the Bible says it returns back to its house. House. You see? Because this is your house. But who are you? And when God is instructing, he's not instructing your house. He's instructing the spirit in the house. He's instructing the man living in the house. And that is why he spoke to them in parables. Why? Because we're not yet born again. So if they're not born again, how dare he preach the gospel to them? 
in a certain way. How can he give them a certain understanding? He says, for the carnal man, the Amplified says, the non-spiritual man, he cannot receive neither design the things of the spirit, for they are spiritually designed, they are estimated, they are compared, they are weighed spiritually. The natural man can't receive them. They cannot communicate to them. Flesh and blood cannot or does not inherit the kingdom of God. So when he's speaking to men of flesh and he knows that they're not yet connected to the awakening of their spirits because of the salvation of the soul is not yet there, he will speak to them in parables because that's the only way they can understand. That's how the men which were not yet born again were. A prophet had to come. God would help the king understand that it was wrong to kill Uriah and take over his wife. That's just how indifferent the fallen nature is. It doesn't matter how many books it has. It doesn't matter how many sciences it has. It doesn't matter how much exposure it has. It doesn't matter how much technology it has. The fallen nature is indifferent to the true knowledge of God. That is why you should never compare yourself with anyone who is not born again. They can't equal you. Not in any way. They can't be richer in the world. But they can't be richer in the spirit. They can't be wiser in the world, but they can't be wiser in the spirit. That's why we don't unequally yoke. Because if you unequally yoke, it means even in your communication, you're going to get so lost in conversation. Unless you choose to be callous enough to fall in the class of them which are ever learning, but never come into the knowledge of the truth. But when you know the truth, the freedom and liberty that it brings to you will not allow you to sit in certain spaces, to engage in certain realms, to transact with certain altars. Why? Because there is a way you know God. He says you have an unction from on high. You know all things. You aid all things. You conceive all things. You connect to those things. And it's a space of faith because you are a child of God. Glory to God. And so we approach that space, by the way, by faith. By faith. When Jesus tells his disciples, But you have those eyes. It's given to you to understand the mysteries. Why? Because they're disciples. They're teachable. They're teachable. This word of God is so deep. It is so deep. The word is so deep. It's so deep. And if you've never met a man or a woman who can break this thing for you, who can help you walk with this, the Bible can become the most obscure thing in your life. It can become the most boring letter you have ever read. But oh, getting this thing with the right sight. Getting this thing with the right experience of things. Getting this thing with the right apprehension of the things of the Spirit. You'll be amazed at the things God will show you. That is why you see the man's heart panting, wash my eyes with self that I might see. He's telling him, open my eyes that I might see the wondrous things which are in your law. What is he thinking? What is he panting over? What is he asking God for? He's saying, I cannot go to the next level if I don't see the right way. I will ever learn, but I will not come to the knowledge of the truth. My eyes are blind. I don't see as I should. That's why when we're defining sight in the faith, spiritual sight, biblically, spiritual sight by the way of God, is the knowledge of the truth, not for numbers, not deaths of birth, not names. Oh, I see your name. No, no, we see those things. Oh, I, somebody's phone number or a number plate. That's not sight. Sight is when the eye is open to the knowledge of the truth, for it is eternal life, that you might know the one true God and his only son, Jesus. Do you think God is interested in showing you a number plate, yet you don't understand Corinthians? In showing you a date of birth? Of somebody when you cannot interpret the book of Romans? You see? Why did he give you the word? Why did he become flesh but as the word? Why did he come as the word? Why is he the word? Because in there is the life. So I'm not against prophetic details. I've had some in my life. I've seen some who move in there. But after you do that, demystify the mystery Christ. Demystify the mystery Christ. Because it's only by the realm of truth that we can truly demonstrate God. I've opened this Bible, and as I'm preaching, people are healed. I've opened this Bible, and as I'm preaching, people are filled with the Holy Spirit. I've opened this Bible, and as I'm preaching, people are slain in the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not that they don't want to compose themselves. No. But every time you demystify a mystery... 
you're breaking into certain realms. Deep calleth unto deep. And so as God is breaking certain realms for you, some depths are broken for you to get into deeper depths. And as it continues launching you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, so the anointing as well is stirred because the person of the Holy Spirit is available for the manifestation in the physical realm of anything that the word is able to command. Remember in the beginning, the word of God was hovering over the earth. And there was nothing the spirit of God could do until God said, let there be. Let there be. Let there be. And when that word is commanded, let there be light. Let this happen. Let this happen. And when that word is commanded, the affirmation of the second realm of vision comes through even by God. And he saw that it was good. So again, even in our visions, that degrees. Even God has to see that it is good. But he's God. But yeah, he has to see that it's good. He's approving another realm. There are about three realms of vision when it comes to perception. When it comes to perception. So, I know that you see miracles, signs, and wonders. I know that you see details in the spirit. I know that you see your job. I know that you see, you read, you do all of that thing. But do you see, do you perceive by the spirit? Do you perceive by the spirit? Do you really perceive by the spirit? Because if you don't, you will never come to the knowledge of the truth. You will never come to the knowledge of the truth. And if you never come to the knowledge of the truth, you will never walk in true freedom and liberty. Well, there is a generic freedom, a generic liberty, and that can give you food on your table and clothes on your body. You can receive the portion of the heathen and still live a good life. But if you're talking about the elevation into the responsibilities that govern the call, the assignments of the kingdom of God, then you're going to have to pay that price. The grace of God is available and is inviting you. Even now as I'm preaching, somebody has shifted from the realm of ever learning into the realm of coming to the knowledge of the truth. And when those things start to happen, when you open the word, oh my God, oh my God, when you open the word, you will hear the Spirit speaking. You will hear the Spirit speaking. And when he starts to speak, you will experience the true liberty of divine thought. You'll understand what it means to really know God. And how in that knowledge of God, the elements melt. The things that are be grow strangely dim. Like one man sang, in the light of his glory and grace. That which seems unchangeable is only unchangeable according to the perception of one's reality. What is real for us is based on what is in the word of God. That is why this man can get on a, on a sea and out of a certain reality, he can't sink. But it's flesh and blood. Because there's a consciousness that is awakened too. And it's defined in him as the word. Is the very word that tells Peter, by word, come to me. And that man makes a few steps, even though he sinks later. But another man, Peter, who was not in the level and degree of the Christ, also walked because the word told him, come. It simply said, come. The word is powerful. It makes him rest in a time where death is. And he says, uh-uh, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. And he gets the news that the man died and does not worry whether they will judge that he prophesied wrongly, but he is certain that he is the resurrection and the life. And if he walks to that tomb, that body has to come out. That is the power of the word. Paul says, I'm not afraid, ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, both to the Jew and to the Gentile. It is the power of God to the Jew and to the Gentile. It's the power of God to the Jew and to the Gentile. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want you to raise your voice and speak in other tongues. Speak yourself into a vision, a perception of knowledge. Speak yourself into the power that sees into understanding, that sees into wisdom, that sees into revelation, that sees into knowledge. Just speak. 
Sharabatala Bakota. Jire Rebo Zatalapa. Zoraba Zakatala Paye Kosha. Zamando Brozo Bokotala Paya Baye Arababa. Ye Basata. O Sabatala Baba Baraba Zobo Kotala Paya Baba. Jire Remando Robo Zabakatala Pa. Jaraba Baba Kosatala Paya Rababa. Robo Ziketele Paya Raba. Zobaya Bakota Sotelepa. O Jile Lebaya. Mo Sabra Katala Pa. Bobo Robo. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory. Majesty. Praise forever to the King. O King Shabatala Bayerelebo, I love you, Lord. Zabakatala Bayerelebo, for your mercy never fails me. Oh, I did. I've been held in your hand. Shabalala from the moment that I wake up till I lift my head. Oh, I will sing Shabababa of the goodness of God. I pray for you right now in the name of Jesus that may God give you understanding in the things you read. May God give you knowledge in the things you see. May God give you revelation in the things you encounter. May God give you understanding in the things that come to your notice. In the things that align to your discovery. In the things that connect to your learning. May God separate you in the name of Jesus in this period more than ever before. That you will hear his voice clear and perfect than you have ever before. And when you do, signs, miracles and wonders will happen in your life. Greatness will be your story. You'll attract, you'll convert, you'll translate, you'll interpret, you will shake, you will change things to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. I pray for those that are sick in your body. Be healed. Be healed. Bones are healing. Backs are healing. Blood disease healed. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, this is the day, this is the opportunity. I want to give you an invitation to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you have never received him, I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for my life. I thank you because you died for my sins were raised for my glory. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.